Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeffrey LeFrancois. I'm the co-chair of the Manhattan Community Board for Waterfront Parks and Environment Committee. As you know, we're having these meetings online uh, because of the pandemic and because of the governor's executive order allowing us to do so. Um, I'm with uh, members of the committee along with my co-chair, Marty DeCat, who's enjoying some coffee. Um, <laughs> and water, water. Water, okay. Um, along with the rest of the members of the committee. Uh, we have two items on the agenda tonight. The first, I'll be handing it over to our board colleague um, to talk about what he has going on with students as it relates to Pier 76. So without further ado, Vera and I give it over to you to dive right in. Okay, um, so very quickly, um, this was a studio in fall 2020 and my students are here, about 13 of them, I believe. Uh, our studio was sort of a little broad-based theme and it was looking at um, inhabiting infrastructures and creating public spaces. And the sort of general title of the studio was Architectures of Care and Infrastructures of Wellbeing. Part of the reason why the studio was structured in that manner was in response to two things that happened in 2020, which we are still going through. One is the pandemic and the other one is the uh, BLM protests. So the students were asked to look at um, architecture beyond what we typically look at. So it's, it's, the title of the studio was Public Private House. So um, the intent being that um, the manner in which housing itself became infrastructure to be able to sort of for us to stay connected and work remotely and teach remotely and learn remotely. And how does that change our relationship with architecture? Similarly, the public space, um, our relationship with the public space also changed. And what does that translate into? And one of the two sites that we looked at, two neighborhoods that we looked at um, besides West Harlem was Pier 76 in the context of it being handed over to the city and to the community, hopefully pretty soon. <clears throat> the students were asked to, to reimagine uh, PS 76 from that sort of broader uh, point of view. So they came up with a whole bunch of ideas and a lot of it is focused on not merely sort of recreational um, um, sort of uh, um, park-like um, setting, but also how we can actually use this collective resource for a lot more than simply sort of, you know, bike path and jogging uh, tracks. Uh, so they have looked at a um, uh, number of different issues. Three different projects is what we're going to start. That's what we're going to look at tonight. Tonight, And these were group projects. Each group had at least three members and one group had, had four members. So with, uh, with that, I'm going to actually ask Janine to start with the intro movie. And if you can make it full screen, please. Janine, you have to share the um, audio. You have to re re restart and reshare. And when you reshare it, you just click on that button which says share audio. Can you hear it? No. Our studio has visited Pier 76, and we have seen the potential that has been denied. Are you able to hear we now? We see the opportunity <laughs> to reintegrate the site back into the city and flesh out the importance of its infrastructure and public service. Manhattan's piers are man-made land. They are the existing connection to the natural that flows around. The pier that should serve as more than a public park, it has the potential to aid the surrounding environment that exists both above and below water. By revitalizing Pier 76, we create a connection to nature, to the community, and to the city. The studio questions the balance between privacy and publicity. 
personal space and collective form. We ask how we might see, reimagine, and draw architecture differently and inhabit space differently. This site has the potential to inspire the many peers surrounding New York City as an example between peer and community. It also has the influence to change the perspective of underutilized and abandoned spaces that live in our cities around the world. The development of Highline and Hudson Yards has spurred the process of gentrification within the city. In addition with the pandemic, it has caused greater physical and social disconnections. Analyzing the built environment of the area, we discovered the site has the potential for its proximity to water in the urban center. Pier 76 is within walking distance from Hudson Yards and Penn Station, where thousands of people commute from other states to New York City daily. Healing nature can be defined as a medium to mitigate and mediate the relationship between nature and humanity. Our project views the city as an ecosystem that houses nature and people together. The proposal consists of interchangeable programs centered around the eco lab with the climatorium, including exhibition spaces, eco park, and maker spaces to raise awareness on second nature, climate change, and potential remediation. Its aim is to produce an infrastructure of well being and care to carry out the mission of healing through an incremental development, growth, and adaptability. In response to the city's failure of dealing with the pandemic, this project introduces a new urban landscape that reimagines socialization, new forms of space that emphasize the care for nature, people, and the city. The provided spaces emphasize the significance of easy and quick responses to future outbreaks and the healthy treatment of the surrounding environment. The Garden of Care combines activities of Chelsea Market and the Convention Center into one single space with three functions. This project explores Pier 76 as an integral part of a larger system with grant houses as a counterpoint. Through a peer-to-peer -peer network of exchange, both sites reinforce one another and together reach towards autonomy from systems of neglect and marginalization. In this sense, Pier 76 is a reclamation of public infrastructure to produce green energy, organic agriculture, sustainable building material, and the associated knowledge and skill essential for building a better future. As a part of a greater system, Pier 76 helps build a landscape for longevity for the individual, the community, and the city harboring it. Hey, Janine, is there any way I can share the, uh, you, you know, that, that was just the intro movie, actually, I'm sorry. Janine, is it possible for me to share the videos? It's uh, very grainy because actually it's not downloading fast enough. Are we doing it from the Dropbox? Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll share, I'll let you share the screen. Thank you. I'm going to jump in, it's Tina. It's fantastic. I love it. What you saw was the intro movie. Now we're going to go into the scene. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. No sound. Okay, well, sorry, sorry, my fault. I want to re -share. I'm sorry about that. My name is Lan Hua. My name is Mel Ting. My name is Trisha. Our project views the city as an ecosystem that houses nature and people together. He aims to develop a two-way symbiotic relationship to heal and to nurture nature, while nature acts as a remedy for the human body and mind. Looking into the past, we saw a series of influence on nature by urban developments in Manhattan. The Manhattan was a vast land of untouched topography with swamp and forest. Urbanization has modified into manufacturing land that negatively impact the natural habitat. The increase in crisis put our attention on healing nature on both public and domestic scale within the space of Pier 76. 
We focused our concern on climate change, pandemic, and manufactured landscapes to see how they affect the built environment and human health. We defined three natures. The first nature that consists of the natural landform without human intervention. The second nature, the man-made environments. And third nature, the hybrid natures that mitigate and mediate the negative effects created by second nature. The pier's physical structure is experiencing decay with its deteriorating wooden piles. A project looks at this as an opportunity to unbuild and rebuild the pier in incremental phase manner. People can use parts of the pier for both recreational and revenue generating activities while the construction undergoes. We choose to leave portions of existing wooden piles in space that occupy to naturally decay to ensure the original footprint of the pier. The modular components are interchangeable to allow a parasitic like addition. Each unit shares a connection with each other while allowing expansion if needed. The placement is centered around an anchor program with secondary and tertiary programs branching off from it. The meandering circulation and undulating path enhances the visitors' immersive experiences with nature at where city and water meet. With the flexibility of the modular frame, it has the ability to grow in the future as needed. The plan of excellence shows the public circulation, a central path supplemented with meandering path, that the street level is widely accessible to the public. Programs of the Ecolab, a sufficient space and eco parks are arranged along the central circulation. By segmenting each module, the interior space are flexible and can be easily modified to provide services. The utilization of water is an important element in mitigating the polluted Hudson River. The breeding and preservation of life forms underwater, integrating oyster beds in the eco park and natural habitats along the shore can promote cleaner water and habitat for marine life while bringing fresh air inland. Also raising part of newly constructed piles to support the modules allows more light to penetrate into the water. The open spaces on a deck level allows the visitors to visually connect with the water. The recessed platform also gives them the opportunity to physically interact with the piles and water. The plan shows the interlaced program within the modules and the open space. These programs are laid out to activate space for learning, producing, and engaging. Ecolab is divided into fragments that focus on the research and cultivation of species such as oyster and native marsh plants. Besides, or the eco park can be used as an extension for cultivation and a crematorium that exhibits environmental simulation using technologies that introduce the climate crisis we are facing. The micro spaces are located closer to the entrance for its commercial convenience, and it can be used as a rental space to generate revenue. This interior view is for the climatorium. An immersive experience of nature can be created with 3D projections and sound installation collected from nature. This elevation scroll is a view from the street towards the waterfront, shows that the hilly nature is acting as an extension of the city and how one's experience changes from the massive skyscrapers and busy traffic into the breeze and water. The view from the river to the city, healing nature blends within the fabrics of its background and become a public living room of the metropolis engaging with nature and its people at the waterfront. This view is at the entrance of Healing Nature, where people enter the intervention on the central circulation. People will come to enjoy the daylight and fresh air, to experience the sound and rhythm of water, to reimagine our city's relationship to the water and Mother Nature that brought us fortune, and more importantly, to learn and be educated on our current crisis of climate change and environmental sustainability. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Cindy Juan. My name is Karen Montenegro. Garden of Care emphasizes the healing and caring for our communities by creating healthy environments as well as productive landscapes to help heal the mind, the body, and the soul. We divided Garden of Care into three programs, the market, green spaces, and caring show. The top diagram demonstrates moments of how the roof changes from the ground to the top. 
but took away parts of the original pier to give about more for the nature beneath water. The roof of the carrying shell has the highest point, connecting to the deck line and allowing visitors to engulf in the beauty of the city across the river. This diagram demonstrates the connection of the urban city to the waterfront, having the car circulation on the north that will lead directly to the carrying shell. On the south will be a bike lane which creates an opportunity for a healthy environment. The roof will encourage interactions between nature, people, and the city. The market is placed closer to the pedestrian to attract the general community to interact with the space. It also connects to all our green spaces to expose people to a healthier environment and be more aware of what they consume. Above the market is the roof farm. Adjacent to the market is the hydroponic center. The hydroponic center functions all year, growing fresh produce that acts as a fundamental connection to the caring shell and market. Our entrances welcomes everyone. We wanted to create easy access for those with disabilities, those who have an active routine life. Our goal is to create a space that families and friends could share while enjoying an open view towards the Hudson River. The market offers produce grown on the roof and hydroponic atriums, which gives the community the opportunity to sell their own health food produce on site. These programs will work together and enable the community to come together. The market will operate all year long, which provides the neighborhood not just healthy produce that is grown in the hydroponics and the roof barn, but also job opportunities and revenue that will maintain the pure longevity. Our green spaces encourage caring for nature, people, and the city. It provides a walking, jogging area, a picnic sitting area, as well as a healing and exercise space for the soul. Our green spaces include the hydroponics, roof farm, and overall landscape, which provides care for the environment while offering tranquility for the human mind. The hydroponic space contains vertical hydroponics, aeroponic towers that are placed on different platforms. These steps allows the space to expand the view and the perspective of the consumers and allow us to utilize the space efficiently. At the center of the hydroponic space is a container that acts as a reservoir and collects water from our roof to be filtered and distributed to our hydroponics towers, as well as all the plumbing fixtures in our garden of care. The roof farm is placed above the market to easily connect both programs. Crops are grown passively through the use of water reservoirs. The water reservoirs immediately flow down from one plant bed to the other and are controlled to evenly connect and distribute water to our crops. All crops harvested from this farm can immediately be purchased in the market as well as be picked from the plant bed by the consumers when ready. We created an atrium in the center for the public space and seating areas to easily eat food purchased from the market. This atrium contains door outdoor green space that hopes to heal and relax the human mind and body. During our investigation of this pandemic, our focus was directed towards frontliners and their immediate contact and danger with COVID-19. The caring shell acts as an adaptive and versatile space that can accommodate and manage future outbreaks, emergencies, and unforeseen calamities. On a regular day, the shell functions as an educational space and galleries exhibiting local and famous artists. During an outbreak, the shell is reconfigured into temporary housing for physicians and emergency units. With the use of movable panels, these reconfigurations are made to be easily adaptable as well as making the space more interactive. Our project, Garden of Care, is a form of architecture that hopes to bind the surrounding urban landscape and open spaces of the neighborhood, from the current piers to the High Line. In the future, we want visitors to experience more programs that embrace a public space with nature and healing of the mind, the body, and the soul. We are presenting Autonomous Sounds. It's located at Pier 76 near Hudson Yards and works in relationship with our prototype partner site located at Grant Houses in Harlem. The sites work in tandem to build landscapes for longevity for the individual, the community, and the environment. The project sees the city as a site 
and envisions a peer-to-peer network of exchange through connectivity, communication, and production for the neighborhoods to reinforce each other and collectively attain autonomy from systems of neglect and marginalization. Initially, we explored the spatial qualities of protest as one of disruption, flowing across the city, both contesting and representing the public space it is occupying. Using the Black Lives Matter protest of summer of 2020 as an example, by physically and symbolically contesting the structures and power relations that try to control it, protest has the potential to illustrate a spatial reality that could exist, enlarging the possibilities of representation and self-determination. Pier 76 is set within this context at Hudson Yards, the largest and most expensive private real estate project in US history. It's a development on public land for private profit made possible through the developer's use of gerrymandering to expropriate and steal government redevelopment funds intended for low-income communities in places like Harlem. Exhibited here are some of these juxtapositions. While income, education, and food access are drastically different on each site, Hutton Yards was able to access the same types of funding used for public housing projects across the country via the aforementioned gerrymandering. Our approach for the pier includes reclaiming the city's waterfront as public infrastructure, declaring education, energy, and food as human rights, and becoming a beacon of New York City's commitment to the climate crisis. The pier captures wind, solar, and tidal energy, while the ecology on the site sequesters carbon. Within the context of the pandemic, Pier 76 would address the recently intensified threats of job insecurity, food insecurity, and the gross lack of breathing room for social distancing in the rapidly densifying urban fabric. The pier produces green energy, organic agriculture, green building materials, and the associated knowledge and skills essential for building a better future. Utilizing the existing historical pier infrastructure, the project proposes to harness the available sources of renewable energy on the site and design architecture as infrastructure integrated with the performative and productive landscape by forging productive relationships between the site and programming. The southern terraced side of the pier is designed as a stepped landscape for farming that also acts as a tidal sponge, while the northern side is conceived as a raised landform that provides interior productive spaces, a market, and a series of community classrooms. Extended piles function as frameworks for pop-up and clip-on appendage spaces, such as greenhouses in the winter or public restrooms. Our intervention challenges rapid urban densification for the purpose of profit. Instead of private profit generated on public land, as is the case in Hudson Yards, we reclaim public space to increase equity and address symptoms of unchecked capitalism, a public space for public good. Inspired by examples like New York City's own swirl burge, a mobile pier and Pier 76's north site would grant space for different interdisciplinary programs. The mobile pier is a detachable portion of Pier 76 that can dock and embark two different places. While docked, the railings on either side are pushed down and the sides rotated, allowing the mobile pier to serve as a natural extension. When embarked, these close. While the mobile pier has some designations, the main level can have interchangeable functions within it, like hydroponic units, planting beds, and technology hubs. By having the tools mobile from one site to another, It allows for people to develop skill sets and resources wherever they are. Instead of reworking everything existing, we are curving out elements using the infrastructure of the piles. First would be the removal of the existing shed and flooring, then curving out and removing parts of the remaining pile's substructure. Lastly, placing a new surface element atop that infrastructure, ending with the addition of greenhouses and the mobile pier, which can have the potential to be added to as time goes on. The undulating pathways supported by the extended piles allow for a variety of vantage points to the water and for air and sun to flow through the pier to the ecosystems below. The piles which hold the floating farms in place also generate hydroelectric energy as the tide rises and falls. As you meander the productive landscape, you become more aware of your position in relation to the water's changing tide. 
Here is an example of the tide change over a single day where the floating farms rise and fall along with it and the tidal sponge soaks up any overflow. The Pier 76 intervention forms a dialogue about exchange of knowledge, space, production, and culture around the idea of the city. It becomes part of the connective tissue of the city and therefore a collective resource for all New Yorkers. That's it, thank you guys. Is there, are there, is there another video of Aaron? No, this is the third project. We had three projects. That was the final. Okay, I thought so, I just wanted to make sure. No. Okay, uh, well, first of all, bravo. Um, thank you for this. I know that just so everybody knows some background on this, Viren and I were chatting and given his studio um, and, and our recent um, news around Pier 76, of which I have some more information to share on that too. Um, we thought it was just a good idea to, to have a short conversation around what his studio had proposed. If folks have questions, Leslie, I just saw your hand go up. Um, I'm sure people would, uh, the, the really talented people that put these presentations together probably have some answers. Leslie? I put my hand up early because I don't think I've ever gotten emotional at a WPE meeting before <laughs> at a presentation. And I got to tell you, I'm tearing up. So Jeffrey knows there's a few of us who are on this call who are actually on the Hudson River Park Task Force um, reimagining the space for Pier 76. And early on, I said, you know what? It should be an environmental beacon. It should be something where people in the city come, but also visitors come like a destination area. You just gave me all the ammunition I need, right guys, that I can kind of go and say, this is actually something that can be done, whether it's elements of it, or whether, you know, like you can mix and match. Um, I think this is spectacular. I think it is exactly what I kind of had in my head, but I had no idea how to kind of say the words or express um, what I was thinking. But I, I think it's amazing. You guys did such a phenomenal job and I'm being very effusive, I understand, but this is months ago what I was kind of looking for in a, destination environmental space that people would just really love to be around. And it's so environmentally forward that, like I said, it could be a beacon. Anyway, great job. I know I'm gushing, so I'm gonna stop because it's embarrassing, but uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Leslie. Darren, would you mind stopping the screen share so we can see faces sure. again easier yes, sure. or easily? Thank you. Um, any other members of the committee have questions or comments? Is there anybody in the public who has questions or comments? If you want to use the raise um, hand function, Marty, go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to effuse the way uh, Leslie did, consider it done. Hmm. Uh, ter terrific work. I, I, I am curious, um, I, I'm just, I want to press on what you did. did. Did your teams talk about financing at all? Did they talk about how expensive their various projects are? Um, before a student's answer, I just want to quickly uh, um, pick up on um, what Leslie was saying. Um, one of the sort of uh, premise, one of the considerations for the premise for the studio was very, very clear. That we have many, very many peers across the city. Um, and we, each community looks at it as something that belongs to that particular community, but the size of Pier 76, uh, the scale of it changes the entire sort of equation in a huge way. And the proximity to Highline, proximity to Javits Center, makes it a very different kind of place, number one. Number two, um, piers were designed as infrastructure for the city. And it was an active waterfront, right? And they were used for transportation, for um, um, bringing goods back and forth. And we kind of, somewhere along the uh, line, we lost that focus. And we started using piers more for recreational purposes than for productive and performative purposes, which is where uh, uh, putting the spear back into the idea that it actually belongs to the entire city and there are connections between these peers that need to be explored. I think that was one of the sort of major issues. So I agree with you, Leslie. I think changing the scale of looking at 
the, the spheres increase the amount of work these architecture students actually ended up doing. I don't know if I made it clear to you, but these are undergraduate students, these are not graduate students. So you're talking about uh, uh, amazing level of maturity in terms of research and data collection that they've done. I mean, one of the groups, group two and group three, they looked at New York City as a city of pandemics actually, starting with a 1918 flu pandemic and how Central Park altered itself and other places in New York City altered and how different hospitals came about. You actually begin to see the logic with which city reorganized itself almost 100 years ago. And city is beginning to do that now. So we can't look at peers or any other public space without taking into account that context in which we live today. Uh, to uh, Martin's point, um, we had to sort of, we, we, they did consider to some extent uh, revenue generating sort of capacity that the peer will need to offer. We invited um, Hudson River Park Trust folks who came in uh, mid semester and explain that, listen, we don't get money from state, we don't get money from the city. So to run this peer operations, we need to find ways of generating income. So some students did sort of take that into account and consistently in all three projects, you would see that they're trying to uh, uh, kind of meet at some point. So they're multiplying the peer. It's not a single level peer. It's at least two or three levels that they're creating. So some intentionality in terms of how this would become revenue generating operation is kind of taken into account, but I'm gonna let them speak to that. So I, I respect uh, very much the assignments that you've given and the product that these students have produced. And that's why I sort of, I'm pushing the envelope a little and I understand that I, I do it respectfully. Uh, the second question I had, uh, the, it relates to the financing, is have your teams gotten together and decided what elements they would put into a final product or didn't you have time for that? Yes, in terms of programming they have, I think I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let them talk because this is their show. So um, folks, go ahead and answer the question. Um, thank you for the question for our project, the uh, Healing Nature. To your first question, that if we have ever considered about the financing issue, um, therefore for us, we proposed a incremental development to incrementally unbuild the pier from um, all the way uh, the, on the edge that is closer to the river, and then slowly incrementally build towards the shore. Therefore, um, partial parts of the pier, they will remain um, active while the construction started all the way at the end. And um, that way it allows um, for budget flexibility. So if they, um, in the future, they would love to, or they have the ability and budget to continue adding on with those modular systems that we, our team proposed, then they can do so when they have the budget flexibility. Just to add to that, what this group did was they looked at uh, the entire peer and they took seriously the sort of a presentation by uh, HRPT that the actual wooden peer is in very bad shape and the peer eventually will have to be rebuilt. The, 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 the piles below will have to be rebuilt. So they propose that you start with the fire end and while you are actually putting new peers in, you continue using the front part of the shed. So they're not dismantling the building in one go. They want that to be done incrementally. Uh, so by the time you come to the front end, you already have more usable space already built at the far end. That's the kind of, you know, checkerboard logic. Anyway, anybody else from the group? Adding on to Professor Yuan and Lanha, we also propose a tertiary program, which is near the entrance as a rental space to invite the local artists or like, uh, use as a renovate, like innovating space, and we can rent it to generate re revenue. Um, for our group, um, we thought of the future of how to maintain the pair to keep it going. We thought of how we can um, uh, produce spaces that we can earn venue, uh, money and revenue for the future to help this um, keep going on.
Anyone else from the class? Or we'll take the next question. Brett? Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, this is was, this was great. Um, it reminds me back in my architecture school days where you did things not thinking about why you can't do something. You thought about what can be done. So the rest of us, um, I'm hoping, you know, looking at everybody else in the committee, we, we're all living with the, the, the political realities and everything that goes around that here. Um, but one, among the, the, the two things I'd want to point out, one is this is a peer that you, got, you all had imagined for the community, for the neighborhood, for the city. Um, you know, the, the, hopefully you guys all stay engaged and, you know, and, and your, your sense of activism is, is inspiring. Um, we would love for you guys to stay engaged and help us because we know that we're in for a battle because, you know, this is looked at as a peer that's going to be generating revenue for the Hudson River, not necessarily a peer for our neighborhood. So we would love to get get this this movement here that you have you guys have engaged to keep it going for us. Um, the other thing that I, I don't I didn't hear anybody pointing it out, and I think you just must have known it intuitively when you're talking about sustainability. And it's another thing I hope everyone in the committee here, you, you know, we're we're environment committee. Um, there is a theme that I was noticing in, in most of those presentations about flexibility, um, which is the ultimate in sustainability. You know, the better, better than recycling is reusing, being able to move, move things around, repurpose. There was a lot of space that was not um, defined for all eternity. That, that it was very repurposeful repurpose, space, you know, even one pair that can move. I mean, my goodness, that's... This is, this is flexibility. It recognizes that our city changes, our neighborhood changes, and what people would need from that peer is gonna change. And so I wanna applaud you all for, uh, even if you didn't call it out overtly, I'm gonna point it out so we all can make sure we, we notice that there was flexibility built into most of those designs. And I think that was, that was fantastic and the ultimate sustainability. Thanks, Brad. Chris? Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Viren. Uh, and thank you to your undergraduate students. Uh, just first question is, um, you, uh, this is to the students and to Viren, um, but you, you were given this request how long ago? How long? And then how long did it take for this um, final presentation? to come together for us today? What was the timeline from RFP requests from the you know, reimagining task force? Uh, so Chris, till, we, till the, there, was no, there was no direction from the, the Pier 40, Pier 76 task force or the community board for-, for So, but you, no, no, so, okay. Then re, let me restate. There was a conversation that happened. Viren has his amazing students in this amazing project. How long did this take to come together? Because this is if if it's in a matter of short amount of time, um, you know I, I'm I'm incredibly excited to see what the students think can go into the final modules uh, for a, a tiered out build out. This was a semester long uh, project. Uh, we didn't take any direction from either the community board or from HRPT or anybody else. This was actually a decision that I, in this was an advanced studio. So I actually designed this, the studio brief and I come up with the syllabus. So it's unlike what happens in other schools. Architectural schools require the faculty to do a lot of homework before they offer a studio. So uh, it took me about, I would say, you know, through the summer, I was thinking about that and we put together, I put, I put together the syllabus. Students spent 15 weeks through the semester of fall 2020. So we started around late August and we completed all the work by, <clears throat> uh, remind me, when did we complete? I think uh, December sometime. Yeah, early December. This is absolutely incredible. Coming from a project management position uh, point of view, uh, I can only applaud and I, I, I yield to David Haloka. I know he's got plenty of things to ask him and speak on. Thanks, Chris. Uh, David and then Brad. Um, I don't really have things to ask, but uh, I, I just think this is wonderfully thought provoking. Uh, you know, the shed at uh, Hudson Yards has this big canopy that's supposed to open and close. And one of the complaints about it is that it never does. But um, 
Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that it dates back to a project from the 1960s by Cedric Price called the Fun Palace. And that was an era, you know, of Japanese metabolism and plug-in architecture and archigram where entire cities might rebuild themselves and, and modules might plug into things. And it was all about flexibility and the fact that you can't know the future. And, you know, I love these ideas of modularity that are in here and the ideas of the uh, the floating piers. Um, and one of the big drawbacks of the existing pier is the vulnerability and the decay of the piers that support it. And it makes me wonder if this entire pier couldn't float and have interchangeable elements that could be carried away on the water and, and or brought back and um, you know be more sustainable because of that because it could rise and fall on the water i just want to thank you all for a really exciting thought-provoking uh, project david i think you hit, hit the nail on the head um the project actually started looking at peer as a site and unlike traditional architectural sites this is a non-site, it's a constructed site. It's not real land. Everything is floating about it. So they did look at that. The second thing I wanted to tell you, <clears throat> Cedric Price was one of their case studies. Not only the Fun Palace project, but also Think Palace. I just didn't want the audience to get bored speaking about architectural theoretical projects that happened in the past. But Cedric Price was one of the um, major kind of case studies that group member, I mean, all the groups looked at it actually, but um, um, healing, um, I mean, the, the, the very first project we, we looked at, but actually considered that project very, very carefully, actually. Um, the other thing that I wanted to tell you that to talk about is that decay was extremely important for that particular group, but they wanted to understand decay and actually use that as a design element. So let the peer decay as it is decaying and when you reconstruct, they were actually willing to give away parts of the pier in consideration for the, the life underwater. That is actually a very large footprint, 750, 750 feet by 350 feet. It's larger than any city block, actually. So that's a lot of um, you know, cover that actually floats over Hudson River. And yes, um, everybody is right, but the focus was um, ecology, the environment and the climate change. So a lot of conversation that can, cannot happen here and I wish my students would talk about it, but they did consider a, um, a sea level rise and what will happen if the water sort of comes and floods the space. So the whole, all three projects actually take that into account, which is why you see very many open areas that water can actually just flow, flow, uh, um, flow right through and the pier doesn't get sort of, you know, doesn't start falling apart. Anyway. Well, it reminds me of- David. Sorry. Oh, I did. I was it, saying it just, thank you. It, it reminds me of, of the big thinking that went on in the 60s. And uh, I wish we could apply something like that here. Thank you, Viren. Brad. Good evening and thank you, students. What a wonderful job. Uh, this board has been fighting for the environmental side of it. You showed it. This board has been fighting to have other add-ons such as the floating gardens and we're trying to find other revenue besides an office building and you showed that we could grow crops there and and actually have a real business that could bring money in for the park so well done turbines the rest is fantastic uh going back to martin's comment about the money so Varen, it would be great, and this is a very good start for us, but the trust challenged us to say, what can we do with a blank, just knock down facility and just have the, the uh, asphalt covered, right? And because it could take years before something happens. And it would be great to hear back from you like this to say, hey, this is how we imagine a temporary space for 10 to 15 years, because I think that's what's going to take to get the money. Um, and it, with the imagination of your students, they could probably come up with something great because what the city came back to us was, let's do a roller rink. Let's put some lines down. I mean, it was just like, I couldn't believe it. So it'd be fantastic to see 
if you can, <laughs> another program to say, this is what we could do with what's existing there. Just a thought. Uh, but great job, guys. I, I have to say, Leslie said it right. It was emotional. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, one more Pat. thing, because I'm a drone guy. A possibility <laughs> to bring in money is an Amazon floating dock that attaches. That money alone could pay for half the park. Brad, so I just, wanted Brad. To, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, Leslie, I'd like to go to the member of the public unless it's something specifically new so we can keep this moving. We do have other items on the agenda tonight and I have some exciting one, new one pictures to on share this. on Pier 76. Just one comment on the, just one comment for the record. I know people think this is fanciful. I know people like thinking the money, this, that. I got to tell you, there are elements in here that people are doing in other areas already. The hydroponics, I mean, maybe not the wind turbines, but you know, that's expensive obviously, or maybe not cost effective in this particular area. But this is not far, as far-fetched as some people think. I mean, the floating barge, uh, that, I just wanted to say that for the record. It's not as far-fetched as some people think. Um, I think it's a terrific job. Thank you. Okay, if we could go to Jen. Jeffrey, may I, may I make one comment? It's quick. Sure. Uh, Brad, Brad reminds me because he and I play uh, tag team often asking for solar and wind. And uh, when, when a project comes in, one of us says, well, why didn't you do that? And here it is, somebody's come in finally with all those elements in it. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Um, Jen? Jen, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, first of all, just showing you all the sunset. Jen, if we can get right to the comments, please. I'm setting up Pier 62. Fabulous Thanks. presentation. The Youth are our future in coming up with these brilliant ideas. Like I, like Leslie, felt like crying. I was walking my dogs. I couldn't like, I couldn't process everything that I was hearing. I think it's fantastic. And I also agree, as I've said before, like this is one of those meetings where I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. Um, I also agree that Amazon, Google, or uh, Facebook could pay for it. That's where the money comes from and it comes immediately. Just an idea, but uh, to the students and to the instructor, amazing. I'm like beaming and I have goosebumps. So thank you. Thanks, Jen. Viren, you inspired tonight uh, and your students certainly uh, inspired tonight. Um, what's really exciting um, is that Pier 76 is transforming as we speak. Um, I put together a half a dozen pictures of the tour that I took last week with Lowell in which you walk on this pier and you can see the sky because they're tearing it down. Um, and so I, I was gonna bring that up in new business and so we can talk a bit more about it at that point too. Um, but if there's any other questions um, specifically on this, if not, we'll move to the next topic on our agenda with great thanks to these undergraduate students that I actually didn't realize, Viren, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, congrats and bravo to you all. Thank you, Jeffrey, and it's wonderful for the students to come and join you guys here today. Sure. Thank you, students, too. Thank you so much. Okay, um, thanks everybody for those comments.